information on uh, Mercury in the Great Lakes region was a binational effort, and it was a three-year effort that began in 2008. Uh, institutions leading this effort included the Biodiversity Research Institute under the guidance of uh, Dr. David Evers and the University of Wisconsin La Crosse. I am Jim Weiner. I'm a research distinguished professor at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, and I've been very pleased to be a part of this effort. This was, as I mentioned, a three-year project and involved uh, uh, scientists and managers from the United States and Canada. More than 170 persons participated in this overall project. Uh, we had two workshops, uh, one in La Crosse, Wisconsin, the second in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I'm very pleased to say that we have a total of 55 institutions that, that were involved in this, uh, and those include state, provincial, federal, non-governmental, and academic the institutions. The idea was to try to synthesize information on mercury uh, for not only the lakes themselves, but all the land areas that surround the lakes. So we contacted people who were working on mercury who had interest in doing this uh, multidisciplinary study and we asked them to look at different aspects of the mercury problem. So people looked at mercury emissions into air and, and transformations within the air and uh, the, the depositing of mercury on land and the transformations that occur on land, the transformations that occur in different types of organisms and then there were aspects of the policy. Our exposure to mercury is not really through inhaling air, but through fish. And the way that works is that mercury coming in from the air pollution is deposited on the land, and then it, it gets into water, and it's converted to a, another form of mercury called methylmercury. And methylmercury has interesting characteristics in that it accumulates up organisms within the food chain. Findings were encouraging, and they indicate that prior measures taken to reduce mercury emissions and usage in the United States and Canada have produced measurable benefits. Uh, these benefits include decreases in mercury concentrations in fish and wildlife, as well as decreases in the deposition of mercury to lakes, as indicated by analysis of dated lake sediment cores from inland lakes. However, the fish data also show that many game fish from northern parts of the Great Lakes region, particularly those in inland lakes and rivers, contain mercury concentrations that exceed fish health guidelines for sensitive groups of humans. And those sensitive groups include women of childbearing age and children, generally up to the age of 15. I think the, the bottom line is that the uh, area has uh, substantial contamination uh, of mercury, uh, the Great Lakes themselves, but probably more significantly is the areas surrounding the Great Lakes, the various smaller lakes and streams that, that drain into the, the Great Lakes themselves. And, uh, uh, from a fish side of things, we rarely think of the impacts of fish. We think of mercury and fish and how that impacts people. Well. One, within the special issue, there's a study by Mark San Heinrich that really examines the, uh, how methylmercury can have a, a toxic effect to the reproductive success of fish. And from, a, from an economic standpoint, um, if we have populations that are being impacted by a toxin so they're not as uh, robust, then that, in the end, could have impacts economically through recreational commercial fisheries. So I think we should keep that in mind, that there are impacts on fish populations from mercury as well. But for the policymaker, it's an interesting time with respect to mercury. There are a number of international uh, negotiations that are underway with respect to mercury. Some of our mercury comes in from uh, outside of the U.S. borders. Some of it is, is locally derived. There's also a, uh, a rule that's being considered by the EPA, which is going to be uh, decided upon in November about controlling the largest source of mercury emissions in the U.S., and that's from power plants associated with coal combustion. 
So there's a lot of activity, policy activity associated with mercury, and we're hoping that the timing of this report is good and it will help inform people about uh, the nature of this problem and, and intelligent you know, decisions to, to address it. That new science that will be coming out in those papers uh, will provide a lot of information for policymakers, decision makers, uh, landscape managers, other scientists, the general public as well, to really get a feel for how is mercury distributed in the environment in the Great Lakes and where are the places that there should be of concern and what do we do about that? How do we manage for it from a landscape standpoint but also how do we manage it from a policy standpoint? And then how do we monitor what's in the environment over space and time? And a lot of the interest from these regional workshops, we had that first one in the Northeast and now we have a second one in the Great Lakes. These, the information from these regional workshops we fit into a national program called MERCnet. And MERCnet really will look at eventually uh, national mercury monitoring levels over time. Mercury research remains an area in which landmark discoveries and substantial scientific advances are being made. In the area of wildlife toxicology, for example, we have long believed that risks to wildlife were limited to aquatic food webs containing fish. Recent work, however, has shown that methylmercury exposure of terrestrial organisms, such as songbirds and bats, uh, can uh, harm these organisms. In other words, the scope of the potential and the potential severity of the mercury problem for wildlife are probably much greater than previously recognized.